This is episode 17 of The Investor's Podcast. Broadcasting from Bel Air, Maryland, this is The Investor's Podcast. They'll take complex things and make them seem insanely simple. They make your boring drive to work feel exhilarating. They give you actionable investing strategies. Your host, Preston Pish and Stig Broderson. All right. How's everybody doing today? This is Preston Pish, and I'm your host for the Investors Podcast. And as usual, I am accompanied by my co-host, Stig Broderson, out in Denmark. So uh, today, we've got a very exciting guest, and his name is Stefan Arstall. And for anybody in the United States, you're probably familiar with this show called The uh, Shark Tank. Uh, for our audience abroad, you might not necessarily know what the show is about. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to briefly describe uh, what the show Shark Tank is all about. And it's a very popular show here in the United States. What the Shark Tank does is it brings on different people that pitch ideas to uh, high powered investors. Uh, there's a couple billionaires on the show and uh, all the other investors that are on there are well worth over a hundred million dollars each. So the combined value of all these uh, sharks on the show is is probably upwards of like two to four billion dollars in total for the people that are getting these ideas pitched to them. And so what's really neat about the show is these these up and coming entrepreneurs come on and they pitch their ideas like, hey, I've got this idea for this uh, glasses holder that you'd put your eyeglasses into your shirt pocket or something like that. And so then the the sharks will argue and they'll, they'll sometimes fight over uh, equity into the person's business. And the, the great thing about the show is they do it all live right there and the, and the negotiation takes place right there on TV. And it's really quite interesting and quite funny and fun all at the same time. And so our guest today, uh, Stefan, he went on this show and he presented his company, which is a paddleboard business, and it's called Tower Paddleboards. And he presented the idea to the investors, and it was it was a very interesting episode. And for me, this was a very uh, this was an important episode for me because it aired a, a few years back. How far back was it, uh, Stefan? Two years ago? Uh, yeah, well, not quite two, but 2012. Okay, so back in 2012, he uh, went on the show. And for me, I was watching this interview and Stefan went on the show and he started pitching his idea to these billionaires and they're starting to argue and they're shooting all sorts of holes through his idea and his business plan. And Stefan's up there trying to defend it. And then he said something that was really quite interesting and something that was really poignant that that resonated with one of the billionaires on the show, Mark Cuban. And he said, you know, so when you searched uh, paddle boards on the internet and you go onto Google and you search for paddle boards, my business will show up not only in the first spot, but it'll show up in the second and third spot too. And as soon as he said that, Mark Cuban's eyes just like popped because they were all kind of like going against you. Correct, Steph? And they were all, uh, they were all getting ready to push you out. The door. In my <laughs> <laughs> they were all getting ready to push him out the door. And then he said that one little nugget. And so when he said that, Mark Cuban's eyes just popped open and he realized, hey, this guy knows what he's talking about. And this guy has some value, some intangible value here that a lot of people might be overlooking. And so uh, you had a couple people that had already said, I'm not investing, I'm out. And uh, Mark Cuban was just kind of sitting on the sideline, listening to the way you were presenting yourself and the different things that you said. And so whenever he said that about the search engine optimization of his site, Mark Cuban made him an offer. And uh, let me look through my notes here to see what it was. Uh, it was for, uh, what was it? Uh, $150,000 for 30% of your company was the offer that Mark Cuban had presented. So what was amazing is one of the people, uh, Kevin O'Leary, who's also a billionaire, he was just you know beating uh, Stefan up and saying how horrible his business was. I can't really remember because it was a few years back, but I remember him kind of beating him up. And as soon as Cuban comes in and he says this about how there was this value and how he made an offer, uh, Kevin O'Leary quickly changed his tune and he all of a sudden now he wants to make an offer to Stefan because he realized the value that Stefan had with his business. And so I really am excited to bring Stefan on the show because Stefan, he doesn't realize this, but he actually had an impact on me and my business at the time because I was watching this two years ago and I didn't really know that much about search engine optimization. And so whenever he came on the show and I saw how Mark Cuban lit up about this idea of search engine optimization, 
I immediately, you could ask my wife, I immediately went out and bought, I don't even know how many books on search engine optimization that night as I was watching this. Um, and so and then I started studying it. I started researching it because I realized how important search engine optimization was for an online business. And so, Stefan, I personally want to thank you because uh, you don't realize it, but you had an impact on me that night that you were on that show. And I realized something that has created more value for myself, has created value for our audience, for Stig and for, for some other people in our community, all because of that, of your appearance on that show. So I just want to take the opportunity to say thank you and welcome you to our show because I'm really excited to have you on today. Well, you're welcome. Thanks, Preston. Okay. So uh, let's fire off this first question. And I think a lot of people in the United States are very curious to uh, know the answers to some of these questions. And, and uh, Stefan, we're not looking for a long answer. We're actually looking for kind of a a quick, short answer so we can get to some of the other questions. But this is to give the audience an idea of what it's like to go on the show, The Shark Tank, uh, because I think there's a lot of myths and a lot of people don't know what it's like to be behind the scenes. But since you've been behind the scenes, we want to ask you those questions. So the very first question, and we're looking for a quick response, is did you get to meet the sharks before the show or was it all cold turkey, you walked up there and, and it just happened? Yeah, you don't get to meet them before the show. So it's not like you're having coffee and then they say, OK, cut, let's go shoot this. You're uh, you're sort of staged with a bunch of other entrepreneurs. They probably see 13 to 15 in a day and it's just one after the other. And they have a short break there. So you're sort of in this back holding room. You come in. First time you see them is when you walk up there. Did you have a chance to talk with some of the other uh, people that were pitching their ideas prior to going up there and, and pitching your idea to the Sharks? Yeah, you're at the Sony Studios and they have like this little you know trailer where there's all these rooms. And there's probably when I was there, maybe 15, 20 people that were in each individual room. And you're just sort of waiting there like we were there for six hours, you know, waiting to pitch. So yeah, you can talk to these people. There's lunch, you know, and stuff like that. Um, yeah, so you do, you do get time to meet some people. And the interesting thing is because then when you watch the show, like, you know, a lot of these people just from you were there right when they were pitching. You know? So yeah. that was interesting. Oh, that's pretty cool. Did you uh, have a chance to interact with any of the sharks after you had done the deal or was it just kind of like, hey, let's go do the paperwork with some of these executives at at the network and then that was it? Or did you have a chance to actually talk with like Mark Cuban after you were done? Yeah, no, you're you're in and out and it's it, it's even odd. So when you when you go in there the first time you you, you see these people, they tell you you got to walk in and you can't talk for a minute. So you have to go up and stand on your spot and you can't smile and you can't talk for a minute. So you're just standing there. It's this really uncomfortable, you know, <laughs> period. <laughs> There's these celebrities in front of you. You can't smile at them and you can't say anything. So they're looking at you funny. You're looking at them funny. And then, you know, the, the sort of buzzer goes off and they, you say, okay. And then you smile and you go into your pitch. And then when you're done with your pitch, you know, like if you make a deal, you give a hug, you know, and then you're, you walk out. It's the last you see. They cart you off across the studio. Wow. So uh, wow. they're probably catching some type of like video footage that they could then edit or something like that. That's probably the way they had you stand in there or something like that. That's pretty interesting. Um, okay. A couple more rapid fire questions. Um, so how long did it take for your pitch? Did you say 15 minutes? No, I would say my pitch was probably uh, 45 minutes to an hour. Okay. Um, wow. On the show, what you're seeing, you're seeing like a, a highlight uh, reel of like a, like a sporting event. So there's, you know, there's big, some people are in there for two hours and then they edit that down to about 10 to 12 minutes of what you see on TV. Oh, wow. So it, it's a lot longer than uh, I would had anticipated. Huh? Um, did any of the sharks um, before you went in, did you have a shark that you wanted to, to work a deal with prior to going in or did you, any kind of deal was something you were looking for? Well, I had never seen the show when they called us to be on it because they wanted a paddleboard company on there because it was sort of a hot, you know, hip sport. And then so they said, hey, would you like to be on this show? And I wasn't even really raising money at the time. Um, but they're like, the show's on ABC on Friday nights. I'm like, yes, I'll be on that show. <laughs> no brainer. So, yes, I will be on the so show. Then, <laughs> <laughs> so then I started looking at the show and you couldn't find much online at that time. And I, I found a couple episodes and I didn't really know any of these people. Cuban was not on the show at the time. He was a guest shark. And then so. Uh, then when I went to film it, you go up to LA for like four days, you're kind of sequestered in a hotel. I didn't even know Cuban was going to be on the show until two days into that. Um, so then wow. as soon as I knew him, knew his name and I, I thought, well, his money's worth a lot more than everybody else's because there's a celebrity endorsement with it. So he was my obvious, um, you know, target. 
but I went in there just thinking, you know, any of these guys will work fine. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's really cool. And for anybody who doesn't know uh, Mark Cuban that maybe lives out of the U S uh, Mark Cuban, he's uh he's worth about like $2 billion. I want to say, and he's the owner of the Dallas Mavericks, which is a, a basketball team, a professional basketball team down in Dallas, Texas. So um, this is my last question, and I'm sorry, Stig, for like hogging all the questions here. Um, I'm sure you're you're rolling your eyes each time I ask another one. But <laughs> <laughs> don't think about it. Don't think about it. <laughs> so, uh, Stefan, uh, this is my last question, and Stig will ask you one. So, uh, so why the paddleboard business? Um, on the show, there was that major turning point that I described with Mark Cuban recognizing your business's uh, SEO position. Is SEO something that you had planned your business around? Or did you optimize your search results after you had established your business? Yeah, no. Uh, so I had a previous business that was a, uh, a high-end poker chip business. Um, so the same chips you can buy in casinos, I sell those to consumers, you know, for their home game. So really expensive, $500 to $1,500. That's a business I started in 2003. Um, it's a business that was doing maybe a half a million a year, but took 10 to 12 hours of my time. So I had a lot of free time. So I was looking for other businesses. And because I was starting businesses with no money, I mean, you got to figure out how, how, you, how are people going to find out about this? SEO is basically just sort of a cheap marketing uh, strategy. And then so when I look at other businesses, I would, uh, you know, analyze them from an SEO perspective. Can I go into this business, spend no money on marketing, and can I, you know, get sales? Because um, if you're starting with no money, that's what you have to do, basically. Yeah. And so I, I sort of look at every business through that lens. And uh, I looked at a bunch of different opportunities. And when a buddy took me paddleboarding, I was like, well, this is fun. Seems like a, wi a wide you know, audience could, could use this product. And then I looked at the, you know, the search statistics on it and they were off the charts because the industry is growing 100 percent a year for like five years straight. And nobody was doing it in a very uh, tech savvy way. It was a bunch of you know, surf companies and you know, old brands. But I figured I could go in there in a very short period of time and sort of dominate that industry. So your, your question is, do you did I start a business and then apply SEO tactics? No, I, I looked at a, I wouldn't start any business unless I knew SEO would work for it. So I just want to throw this out to our audience for anybody that would maybe want to start their own online business. What Stefan just said is really the important part that you've got to understand. So a lot of people are like, oh, I really want to do this. And they start this business and then they're like, oh, I've got to figure out how do I market it? How do I get potential customers? But the people that are truly at the top of their game with online business, people like Stefan, they go out and they understand the search engine optimization. And why this is so important is because if you rank in the number one spot on, on Google for whatever your business might be, guess what? You don't have to pay for advertising. It is free. If you have 10,000 people looking for a certain key search word and you come up as the number one search and they click on it, you literally paid nothing for that advertisement that basically popped up number one. So what he's saying here is that he knew that this market was ripe. He knew there was a lot of people searching for paddle boards. And so then he optimized his entire business around that search engine optimization uh, keyword. And he's done extremely well. I mean, when you went on the show, let me see what some of the stats are here, uh, Stefan. When you went on the show, your full year revenue was 250 K um, the last thing that I, that I saw was in the 2012, you had over 1.5 million in revenue and you're probably well over two or 3 million at this point. Correct. Oh, no, the numbers are a little different there. So you got, you got the revenue the year we aired. So when I pitched the sharks, we had a hundred thousand dollars in revenue lifetime for the company. Yeah. And it was maybe nine months into the, into the business. And then in this last year, 2014, we did five million in revenue. We recently got an award for the fastest growing company in San Diego. Now that's that's any company, your tech companies, VC funded companies, and they they had this award show where they're counting down the hundred, and they get to number one, and you know we go up there and it's five people in the company, and it's a surf company. <laughs> it was everybody's like, how does this happen? Dude, so, that's awesome. That is fantastic. Now, have you been able to hold on to the other seventy percent of equity? I'm assuming you have. Yep. Yep. Oh, great. That, Great for you. That is awesome. What a great news story. Okay. All right, Stig, go ahead and fire away your question. Great. So um, this is actually related to what you said before about uh, you evaluating my Cuban's money to be worth a lot more. Uh, I think I read somewhere it said like three times as much. I mean, there was this was really a guy that you wanted to do business with. But aside from the immediate, uh, immediate attention you got and the funding, of course, how else have you been able to benefit from your relationship with my Cuban? 
So, yeah, and that, that really goes into why I value his money more. Um, the investment was only $150,000, so it wasn't a large amount of money. I could have, probably could have got that money somewhere else. I mean, I'm not an expert at raising money, but I probably could have friends and family, you know, if the business was taking off. But uh, once the, and the, the deal was actually his offer was $150,000 for 30% of my company, plus he negotiated for first right of refusal to invest in any business I do in the future. So that was another thing I was thinking, well, you know, I'll make a little money on this company, but if I do well here, I potentially set myself up to have a backer for any business I want to do. Um, so that was another important reason why I, uh, I took that deal. But um, so what I've been able to, how I've been able to leverage him is when we were negotiating the deal, um, I asked uh, before I signed the papers, I said, hey, Mark, I want to put your face on the front page of our website. So, uh, you know, and that to me was actually more important than the money. You know, having a check that has Mark Cuban's signature on it, you know, for PR purposes is actually more valuable than that check itself. It's the way I was looking at this. And really online, uh, you know, conversion rates are very low. You know, when we started this business, our conversion rates were maybe at 0.5%. So we have a thousand people come onto our website, you know, through SEO and five of those would buy. Where in a, you know, a regular retail store, you walk down the store street and you go into a store, thousand people go into that store, 600 of those people will buy. So there's this massive, you know, chasm between what's online and in retail. So anything you can do to enhance, you know, the trust of your brand, um, you know, can, can ratchet up your your conversion rate. So just putting Mark Cuban's name on, I mean, he's not a, a huge celebrity, but you know, a good chunk of people know him, especially in the sports world, and we're sort of a sports themed product at at, at that time. Um, that really, you know, bumps our conversion up, and we've seen our conversion go up to almost a you know one and a half percent uh, through Mark and some other stuff that we've done. And we've sort of, you know, organically grown our brand over the uh, you know past three or four years. Wow. Wow. That's really impressive. Uh, one thing I want to highlight was actually one of the first thing you said about um, like you were giving, well, not giving away 30 percent, but uh, you're selling 30 percent. Um, and I think that you're really, you know, hitting the nail on this one uh, because I think what a lot of people are missing is that 100% of zero is really still zero. Uh, but what you're talking about is, even though that you might have a small percentage, even though 70% ownership is a lot, um, it's really important how big the, the pie is. It's not it's not like if you own the whole pie or not. Uh, and that's really the key to uh, to stock investing, which is the main main um, issue here for the show. Um, Preston, I see you have something. Yeah, I wanted to add, that, so, you know, Stefan, you might not be familiar with the stuff that we do, but what we try to do is we try to teach people how to value assets, uh, particularly the way that Warren Buffett values assets. That's what our podcast really does. And, and we have a couple sites that teach people how to conduct asset valuation. And one of the things that a lot of people really struggle with is how do you value intangible assets? And it's funny because you're talking about Mark Cuban and how you were saying his signature on the check and just being associated with him was worth countless more dollars than the 150,000 he wrote the check for. And that's something that I think a lot of people miss, especially if they're getting ready to start a new business, to give up 30% equity just for his brand or his stamp of approval, which is completely intangible. There is an enormous amount of value. And you actually see this on the numbers that Stefan is talking about. He's producing $5 million in revenue from you know the numbers that he started with. It's, it's incredible. He's one of the fastest growing businesses. And it's all due to well, a majority of it, I mean, I'm sure your hard work and everything else you're putting into it, I don't want to discount that, but there's an enormous piece of it that's coming from this intangible value of, of being endorsed by a celebrity. And that's something that it's very hard to stick a price tag on, but it's something that you have to properly value whenever you're looking at a business or you know anything that you're trying to properly value. Yeah, I, I mean, that's a good point. And there's Mark Cuban is one aspect here. And the other aspect is, you know, Shark Tank. That show airs to maybe seven or eight million people every Friday. And you would get reruns on there. So we've aired like seven times. So every time that happens, we'll get 40 or 50,000 in sales. But it's like hitting them with with another advertisement for our brand. Um, so those two things are, you know, hugely valuable and, and way more valuable than the money. And Steve, you, you mentioned when you, when you let in there, you sort of, it was a slip of the tongue, but you said you gave away 30% of your company, you know, for this amount, but that's exactly how I look at it. Like there's no way I would have taken 150,000 for 30% of my company. My business plan maps this company out over the first three years to a value, a valuation of about $11 million. So when I actually 
when Shark Tank called us to be on the show or called me to be on the show, there was just me and one other person at that time. Um, they, I, they made me do a pitch tape, right? And never seeing the show, I just figured, well, how am I going to pitch investors? I said, well, okay, first, they're going to want control of the company. No investor is going to put in a bunch of money and not have control of this company. Yeah. I said, number two, they're not going to, they're not going to make a small investment, right? So I asked for $5 million for 60% of my company in this pitch tape. And the, uh, the producers got this and they came back to me and they said, what, what the hell is this? Like, nobody's ever asked for that bunch of money. Are you crazy? <laughs> and I'm like, well, aren't these guys investors? Aren't they billionaires? Like how, how else would they do it? So then I went back and watched a few episodes of the show and I saw, okay, all of these guys are investing in basically no man's land, you know, 150,000 to 250,000 to 5 million where no regular investor would come in. And because who wants to have 20 investments, little tiny investments. And then they didn't want um, control of the company. They yeah. just want to make a little side bet, bet on this horse and let them run with it. So that show is a little, a little different than regular investing. And I get a lot of calls from people who uh, or haven't been approached to be on the show or have applied to the show and they're really close and they're like, you know, I don't know if I want to go on there and, you know, give away some of my company because I think I can raise more elsewhere. And I say, I tell them, I mean, you're looking at this wrong. Like, yep. You need to, to go on there. You're just giving away a chunk of your company, maybe for zero dollars. Don't even look at the dollar amount. And then how are you going to leverage that? And how can you make that, you know, this much bigger pie, which you were talking about, Steve? Yeah. yeah. And is it true that Shark Tank actually have an option uh, on the on the um, companies that uh, other entrepreneurs that are in the show? And uh, that, uh, yeah, there used to be there used to be an option. It was two percent royalty um, at the time I did it. So two percent royalty, an option for two percent royalty on uh, profits, I guess. And then or uh, five percent equity in the company. And then if you had an exit or something like that, they could exercise this. Now, they they didn't exercise that in very many companies. Um, but a lot of people that I talked to, other investors in the show, were really, or other entrepreneurs, were really concerned about that option. I looked at it like I had a company that had a hundred thousand dollars lifetime. I mean, it's five percent of nothing at this point, <laughs> and you get to be on TV. Like, yeah, that that's no brainer. And now that you know it's a five million dollar company, I would love nothing more than for ABC to exercise that option because then I basically have a media partner for another tiny percent of my company, and they can re-air this thing into oblivion. I yep. mean, they're actually coming out with a follow on show called uh, Beyond the Tank. Have you guys heard of this show? No, no. So it's, it's a follow up to Shark Tank. It's a spinoff. And I assume it's going to air in the hour after Shark Tank. And they're going to do like, you know, 15 minute or hour long segment follow ups on, you know, successful companies from the show or maybe successful and maybe unsuccessful companies. And so then and we're already filming for this, you know, starting uh, early in quarter one of this year. And so then we're going to get, you know, even more exposure. Oh yeah, wow. the five percent for all the marketing and the advertising to millions of people is just. <laughs> just yeah, you want their motivations aligned, right? <laughs> heck yeah! All right, hey, I'm going to go to this next one. So, uh, one of the unique caveats in the final contract was Mark Cuban with the uh, first term rights uh, to any equity sale that you have in the new business that you, that you create. Um, I took this, whenever I watched that, I took that as a huge compliment to you because this was Mark Cuban basically saying, I know you're not just going to do it with this business, but you're going to do it with a bunch of more businesses. And I want to be on that gravy train was basically what he was saying. And so have you thought about any new businesses or have you done any more business deals with Mark? Well, I'm a big fan of focus. So I'm trying to, I figure I've got a big opportunity in front of me. I want to knock this one out first. Um, and then I have some other businesses that I would, I would look at doing. Um, but the, the reason that whole thing came up and it was probably hard to read that from the show because it, uh, in one part you guys didn't mention it. So when I started my pitch, I like forgot my lines and, or my pitch, my prepared, you know, two minute pitch stumbled. And I was silent for what was like three or four minutes on the in real time with these sharks, <laughs> like Terry, you know, they actually edited it down, in, in the TV version. But it was still like hard to watch from friends and family. <laughs> um, and then I had to I had to come back from there. And part of that was I looked like an idiot on TV because I you know couldn't communicate my pitch. But the other part was I was pitching this paddleboard company that had you know no proprietary IP. Um, I didn't have a really competitive advantage. I had no money behind me. I had no traction even. And I was going up against you know huge brands that have been around for thirty years. And these guys were like, "How is this kid going to compete? This is ridiculous." And I said. 
no, this is a, this is a no brainer. I mean, I've got free marketing for, for three years. We're going to be the biggest company in this industry. You just give me five years. And these guys just thought I was on crack. They said, that you're crazy. So I had to, and they didn't like the paddleboard business. They didn't realize how big of a market that was. It's kind of a tricky, big market. And so I had to go back and, and tell them like, okay, I, I've done this poker chip business. You know, my brother did this uh, like tree, uh, tree trimming equipment company that he took from, you know, basically about a quarter million in sales to eight million in sales over a period of seven years. And this was a 20 year old company that he basically injected, you know, search engine optimization strategy into. And you just basically eat the lunch of everybody else. So yeah. you're just eating market share, even in, in an industry that isn't growing. So I went through several of these examples that I've been you know, involved with. And I said, look, you guys have all of these companies. You have you know, hundreds of millions of dollars behind you. You know, let me use your sort of war chest. And, you know, it's, it's hard to actually like start a company from zero and grow it to five million sales. What we've done, that's a very difficult. Task, Absolutely. Right? It is. But an easy task is you buy a company for $10 million that doesn't have this stuff. You inject that and we flip it for $30 million in two years. And that is actually where Kevin O'Leary's eyes popped because he's sort of a, an M and a guy. And then these guys saw the, like the bigger picture, like this kid, okay, who cares about the paddleboard company? He could potentially help us in our other businesses. Yep. And, you know, he can do what he's done in the paddleboard business or any other opportunity that comes. This along. is a consultant in my back pocket is the way that they're looking at it. I can consult this guy because he understands SEO better than anybody else out there. And he can turn and, and assist in these other ventures that we have. That's, that's brilliant. That's awesome. That's funny that the way you put that, because, uh, the, the one negotiation, you know, after the shark tank, when we went to do all the due diligence and stuff, the one thing that I asked that wasn't included in the show offer was I wanted to put Cuban's face on my homepage. Oh, okay. And Cuban, Cuban's asked, he's like, okay, you can do that, but I want you to basically free consult with my other 80 companies on <laughs> SEO. And I'm like, okay, fair enough. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> All right. Okay. Go ahead. Steve. Um, let me just uh, pick this up. Uh, what you said before, um, Preston, because as a successful entrepreneur, uh, and I know, Stephen, that you've done a lot of different things, and you mentioned the, the poker chip business uh, yourself. I mean, you must have a ton of different opportunities. And if you are like the rest of us, you only have like 24 hours a day, right? So how do you prioritize which project you should pursue? Um, well, I've, I've really now focused in on, and the paddleboard company has really evolved into, uh, you know, more of what we're calling a beach lifestyle company. So... We have paddle boards now, but our initiatives over the next year is we're starting this this new, uh, basically a um, beach lifestyle magazine. It's a digital magazine initially, but it will be a glossy magazine. We're going to try and leverage the reach of social media to grow just this massive audience of beach lifestyle enthusiasts um, by giving them content. Similar to your guys' business model, right? You're just bringing in this whole audience that's interested in investing, and then you've got the audience, and then you, you make products for that audience as opposed to the traditional uh, business strategy, which is, oh, I've got this great idea for a product, you build a product, and then, okay, how the hell am I gonna market this now? So we're sort of flipping the script there. We've got this nice base, you know, a $5 million business that's you know really, really profitable, and that's probably gonna just sort of organically grow to 10 or $15 million, and then what else can we do? So we're gonna use that money to grow this big beach lifestyle audience, and then bring in other products. Uh, the initial products we're bringing in is like uh, wood sunglasses. Um, we're going to bring in bikinis. Uh, we're actually doing a podcast as well. We have this uh, uh, sort of side shoot of our business called the Tower Girls, which is just you know beach models, basically you know bikini models and stuff like that. And so we're going to have two Tower Girls doing podcasts of you know successful people in the beach lifestyle, you know industry athletes. And stuff uh, like that. This is a this is a rough line of business you're in. I'll tell you. It is. That's, it's funny you say that. So I was in the poker chip business before. And when you've got a business that sort of supports you and you're working 10 to 12 hours a, a day, a, a month, a week, you've got a lot of time to think about what business do you really want to be in? <laughs> and that's actually what I did about two years prior to starting this. I'm like, what would be the perfect job? And I was like, and I live in San Diego here by the beach. And I, I was like, it would be sweet to be like the CEO of a surf company. Like that would be great. doing bikini shoes for traveling to exotic locations. And then my buddy, uh, you know, took me paddleboarding and I was like, holy cow, this all sort of fits together. Like, this is exactly what I was looking for. So, <laughs> so basically like the last 10 years that have been pogor and bikini girls and surfing. <laughs> is, that, is that really what you're telling our audience? <laughs> and, the, and the fastest growing company in San Diego. I mean, geez. Yeah, don't, 
don't, uh, I mean, when people say it's a lifestyle business, they think, okay, well, they're checking out on growth and they're just trying to, you know, pay their, pay their bills and, and work as little as possible. This is a lifestyle business, but I believe this has the potential to be, you know, a hundred million to a billion dollar brand. Wow. Good for you. Good for Seriously, yeah. Stefan, it is just awesome. And uh, we're just so delighted to have you on the show. And I know our uh, audience is eating this up because we're having a blast talking with you. Um, okay, we just have a couple more questions and then we won't take up any of your time because we know you're a busy guy. Um, so this one here is uh, something that I really am interested in hearing your response to. Uh, for anyone wanting to start their own online business or just any kind of business, brick and mortar or whatever it is, what are your top three things that you would focus on during the beginning stages of the business? I mean, the first thing is your your burn rate. I mean, I think that's you got to keep your costs like like super low. Um, I've, I've spoken to a lot of universities and the kids are always like, you know, when should I start a business or what should I go into? And I said, actually, the perfect time to start a business is when you're in school, because basically you've got student loans. You can probably finance the business out of some of that. You can live on nothing and you don't have any expectations. You don't have kids. You don't have a family. You know, you don't have even a, you know, car payments, mortgages and stuff like that. As you get older and older, it gets harder and harder to jump from that secure job and start a business. But when you don't make any money, it's very easy. Um, but as you start this business, you're, you're gonna sort of you know go through cash. And a lot of people say, well, I'm gonna give myself a year to start this business, and if I run out of money, then I'll go back to doing something else. But you wanna get to sort of cash flow positive as quick as possible. When you're not making any revenues, the best way there is just have zero expenses. I mean, don't have an office, you know, don't have, uh, anything. Don't spend any money on marketing. Just refuse everything and say, I'm only going to do stuff that is basically free. And that will get you, um, it does a couple things for you. It gives you a longer runway to start. And then it also forces you to find hacks. Like if, if, if I started a paddleboard company and I had, you know, $500,000 to go out and do this paddleboard company, which a lot of people do in this industry, they go out, they buy a magazine ads, they go to trade shows, they do this, they have this big plan of how to get from A to B which is the same plan that everybody else has. But if, if I say, I want to build, you know, a hundred million dollar paddleboard company and I have no money to do it, you have to find a hack. And a hack is, a growth hack is like, you know, SEO. It's like, I can go for three years and spend zero dollars on marketing or, um, you know, you, or leveraging social media. You know, any way you can figure out to spend no money and, you know, get free marketing. And then you're going to refine that hack and then when you get, you know, three or four years ahead of every, you know, three or four years down the road, you're going to have this natural built in advantage that you've learned because you were forced to. I, I don't want to interrupt you, but I've got to comment on what you're talking about, because so many people think I need to go to the bank or I need to find some venture capital person to give me a hundred thousand dollars so I can go advertise or I need to go do something else. And they miss the point and they miss the essence of what you're talking about because they don't understand that the only way that you're going to get to that cash flow positive position is by being enormously creative and minimizing your costs, like you're saying. And these people that get that that hundred thousand dollar, you know, influx of capital, they just burn straight through it in a, in a couple months and it's gone and they never had to become creative with how they're actually producing cash flow. So I freaking love that point. <laughs> I just, I do. I love that. So keep going. Sorry to interrupt. So, so yeah, that's, that's one point is you got to keep your burn rate low. And then the second point is, and this is something that I struggled through. I mean, when I went off into being an entrepreneur, I was, you know, 31 and I wanted to be an entrepreneur, you know, in college, but I didn't have the right, you know, opportunity or whatever. But in, in college I was taught, you know, here's how you value the business, you know, and then once you got the value on the business, then you're going to go out this and shop this to investors and then get your investment and then start your company. Okay. Well, the problem there is that getting an investor is really hard. I mean, I got an investor. It was a fluke thing on TV, right? But the idea of just having a business idea and finding an investor is enormously rare proposition. I mean, it happens in small pockets in Silicon Valley and it happens if you have, you know, a rich uncle or something like that. Aside from that, there's no money out there. And forget the banks are not going to lend you money. I mean, we're, you know, we just got our first line of credit or anything, even a credit card about three months ago, you know, and we're talking about the fastest growing company. You know, we made a million dollars last year. We couldn't get a $5,000 credit card from a bank. So 
You have to assume there's no money out there. But if you're looking at businesses and you say, okay, this business requires money to start. This business does not require money to start. You put them in two columns and then you take every business that requires money and you throw it. It's off the table, you know, unless you actually have money yourself or you have a rich uncle or something like that. So that's what that's the second thing is just. You know, you know how I picked a business based on would SEO work for this business or not? Yeah. Then you also have to pick a business. Does does this business work for having no money at all? And then focus all of your effort there because I spent probably 10 years, you know, looking at businesses that were these grand business plans, but it required, you know, three million in capital or you know, five hundred thousand in capital. And it's a waste of my time because I'm not a I don't have the ability to raise money. Yeah. And so if I would have just said, I can't do any of that. What can I do for free? Even if that means starting as a consultant or whatever, just, you know, put a shingle up and get started because you need, you know, to get off on your own and then sort of go from there and you can sort of iterate. And, and you got to stay at it. Like you're saying, you got to find something that doesn't cost a lot of money to start. And, but you have to set something on a daily basis that I'm going to put an hour or three hours a day into this and progressively work at it. And time is on your side when you're working in that manner. And that's how you'll eventually grow into that position where you will have the credit or you will have the opportunity to get that influx of capital. If you even need it at that point, most, most companies don't need it. Like yourself, you were saying you didn't even have a line of credit and look what you grew it to. So, um, that, that's a good point there. You put like that sort of that, uh, you know, there's a, uh, some book talks about a 20 mile march like every day, every day you need to do that, you know, that, that minimum over a long period of time. And that's really the, the basis of success. Like when people hear that I was on Shark Tank, they're like, oh, you got you got so lucky to be on Shark yeah. Tank and you know, do this. But if, if you look at that, I've been working for basically 15 years to get to this point. Like I learned all the stuff that I know how to do now, starting in 1999, you know, early on working for another company and then. I started the uh, the poker chip business, uh, you know, with with SEO. The poker chip business was on TV as well, you know, because I I knew like in SEO you want something that's you know pop cultural interesting because then you get free media. It's easier to get links and stuff like that. So I had no you know question that when I started the paddleboard business that we would attract the media. Now getting on Shark Tank was much more than I had you know planned for, yeah. but it's it's this long path, and a lot of people think like oh you just I'm going to have a business idea and I'm going to, you know, work at this for six months and it's going to pop. No, <laughs> it's 10 to 15 year. And everybody will tell you this, that's, that's been had a good deal of success. It's like that, that sort of grind for a long time and then something will pop. You know, I think it was uh, Malcolm Gladwell's book where he says, you know, you got to have 10 years of experience in something before you become an expert of it. And, you know, a lot of people watch the Shark Tank and they just say, oh, that guy's so lucky he got it. But they didn't see the 10, 15 years of growth and learning and how you understood SEO and all those other things that led up to that culmination point. And they just see that culmination point and that's it. So that's really interesting topic. Stig, I saw you had something you wanted to say. Yeah, and that was uh, related to uh, to the poker chip business. I'm sorry, Stefan, that I keep returning to this whole thing by poker chips. It's probably because I used to make a living of playing poker. <laughs> but, you know, yeah, it's just, um, you know, I think it was really amazing that you saw this trend when Chris Moneymaker was winning the World Series. And and I'm sorry if it sounds really geeky or very nerdy what I'm talking about right now. But Stefan Shield knows what I'm talking about. Because I'm sure that you saw that this was really a trend poker because it was now on TV. And you saw this, you know, average Joe, sorry, Chris, uh, winning the World Series of poker, uh, beating all the pros. So it's also just to, to say to the entrepreneur out there that it, you don't have to be a genius. And, and that's really not to discount you anything, Stefan. But I mean, you don't need to have an IQ of 200 or something to be you know, successful. But if you see that like, a new trend is coming like poker or paddleboarding, I mean, um, there are still just so many opportunities out there and so many opportunities that are about to come. The interesting thing with that, the, the poker chip and the paddleboard business are exactly alike. I mean, you sort of nailed it on the head. Chris Moneymaker came in. There was this huge rise in popularity, you know, 50%, 100% growth a year. I saw that. And that is actually very friendly for SEO too, because you're, you're running a race that I know how to run much faster than anybody else. And then when paddleboards came, I saw that I was like, I already know the finish line of this. There was, there was no risk in this business for me. I was like, this is just very obvious. I was actually six months into a different business, uh, a green energy, a portal for the green energy industry. And then I saw this, this, which had, and the green energy thing needed to raise money. It was a much bigger opportunity, but I was like, paddleboard, this is exactly like poker chips. I can actually see around corners in this business. So it was much less risk. 
Wow. Wow. Um, the final question from uh, from me, Stefan. That is, you know, out there we have, you know, so many different advice. You know, probably more bad than good ones. But what is the best investment advice that you ever got? I mean, I'm not really, I'm not really an investor. You know, I'm still trying to figure out how to borrow money from people. To uh, <laughs> I'm, a I'm business more of a creator, you, other people's money type of guy. <laughs> so, I, you guys are the investment experts. I don't, uh, you know, I'm just trying to get money and you know, invest in yourself. I guess that is probably the best investment. I would say is sort of, you know, invest in yourself because you don't have to invest a lot of money. There you go. That's that's some fantastic advice. Yeah, and so the audience, so I. I have two ways of seeing things. There's there's basically two ways that you can invest your money. You can create assets, which is what Stefan's doing, or you can take the money that you've got and you can buy assets. And so typically Stig and I focus on the latter category of going out and buying assets that already exist. But there's a whole nother side to that equation. Um, and that's what Stefan's talking to us about today. And that's creating assets for yourself. And to be honest with you, there's a lot more risk in that area, but the reward is enormous. Uh, a lot of people want to become millionaires overnight in the stock market, and it's just it's almost somewhat humorous because when you're buying assets, that 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 uh, timeline doesn't occur at the same speed as which it does whenever you're actually creating an asset and, and putting something out there for people to consume. And so, uh, just I don't want to throw that out there because a lot of people I think lose sight of that that difference between asset creation and, and the purchase of assets. And so, just something to highlight. Uh, last question, and we really appreciate your time. We didn't intend on uh, taking up so much of your time, Stefan. So we really appreciate that. Uh, our last question is. Do you have any books that you'd recommend for people as they conduct their self-improvement, um, maybe an SEO or entrepreneurship, something like that, that you would, could recommend to the audience? Um, for, for SEO, there's a good book. It's called Search Engine Visibility uh, by a lady named Sherry Thoreau. It was written like 10 or 12 years ago. It's very basic stuff. But the thing about SEO is it's, it's actually very basic, just roll your sleeves up type stuff. There's no sort of quick hacks. I mean, if you're looking at sort of long-term strategies, you have to provide value to people that are searching on the web, give them, you know, information basically. Um, so that, that's a good book. Um, and don't worry about any of the black hat, you know, hacks or the, the latest, what's going on, what's the latest algorithm. I mean, that's all sort of, you know, BS and propaganda, I think within the yep. industry. So you'll hire a consultant. It's very easy stuff. Roll up your sleeves and do it. Um, uh, for entrepreneurs, I would say like uh, Tim Ferriss's book, uh, The Four Hour Work Week, I think is sort of a Bible for for entrepreneurs, and it's it's just it it shines a light on that we are really living in a in a different world um, today. Like, I mean, you guys have this investors podcast. Um, you know, you guys could run this to several million you know viewers. You know, two guys in two continents. <laughs> you know, you're not even working in the same office, and you could create a, a major media channel. I mean, that's what we're doing with our, our tower dot life site, which is a, you know, a beach lifestyle magazine. We really believe we can, we can roll that to several million, you know, a following of that. And imagine, you know, 10 years, 15, 20 years ago, starting a magazine and trying to get, you know, you just hope beyond, you know, hopes that you could get 10,000 subscribers, you know, wow. and make a go of this thing. Well, you can get that in, you know, a few months with Facebook marketing and, and, and you know, a good sort of viral strategy and, and great content. Um, and I think the four hour work week uh, really sort of lays out a roadmap of, of, of what this this new world is. And then um, for sort of a, like a business optimization um, and sort of an iteration uh, guide, I think the, the lean startup is a is a is a great uh, you know book. And there's there's several books in this lean stuff. And this is some stuff that I'm getting into now where, you know, we had a big run with our our, our business initially. And now it's how do we take that base and how do we iterate that and go from, um, you know, because it's one thing to grow to a five you know million dollar company. It's a whole nother thing to take that to a fifty million dollar company or a hundred million dollar company. Um, and that's uh, that's a challenge in front of me. And uh, a lot of that is I can't just fall back on okay, is there an, is there a, a a booming market like poker chips or paddle boards, and can I use SEO to go after this? I really have to get uh, a little more advanced in my business thinking now. And I think that uh, the, the lean uh, learning strategy as you, as you build a business is, is something vital there. And so you're, you're referring to like lean six Sigma and stuff like that, Stefan. Well, there's a book called the lean startup startup. Uh, I think it's by Eric Reese. 
And there's this whole lean, it's not lean manufacturing, uh, but it's sort of similar principles, but applied to uh, a startup or lean entrepreneurship. Oh, okay. Another book called Lean Analytics. So it's then how do you apply, you know, statistics to this? And it's, it's basically the idea of just, you know, getting product market fit and figuring out exactly what people want to buy. Um, SEO, uh, like starting a paddleboard business, is sort of product market fit um, backwards. I figure out what people are buying and I don't make a product unless I know somebody's already buying it. Product market fit is, uh, you know, used a lot in software companies where they start out with, you know, Instagram started out as a certain type of company and then they figure out well, which piece are people using and then you sort of pivot the company towards that. So it's this constant learning and improving and, you know, building on that. So that's, uh, it's, it's interesting stuff, I think. Well, Stefan, seriously, thank you so much for coming on our show. This was such an enlightening uh, interview. I know everyone's really going to enjoy this. It was really kind of a neat uh, glimpse into what's behind the stages at uh, Shark Tank. And then your wealth of information as an entrepreneur and, and startup with the company is just really exciting to listen to and to hear firsthand. So thank you so much for coming on our show. So, Stefan, if our audience wants to uh, learn more about you or they want to go out and buy a paddleboard, uh, how can they uh, find more information about you? Sure. So, you know, our, our paddleboard company is Tower Paddleboards. Uh, so you can just Google paddleboards and you'll find us or go to towerpaddleboards.com. But really, uh, the tower, like a lifeguard tower, is our sort of a beach lifestyle brand. And we're, we're expanding greatly from just our paddleboard roots. We have a new... Um, online uh, beach lifestyle magazine at tower.life um, that we're, you know, if you're interested in anything to do with, you know, the beach lifestyle, we've hired a full-time uh, filmmaker and full-time writers. And there's just a lot of great content and, uh, you know, interesting stuff to anybody that's interested in sort of the beach lifestyle. Um, and that includes sort of the beach lifestyle entrepreneurs too. Um, and then, uh, you know, we're coming out with wooden sunglasses. We're coming out with flip flops. We're coming out with bikinis. Anything related to the beach lifestyle, you can just, uh, you know, go to Tower for that in the future. So what we'll do is we're going to have uh, links in our show notes for all those different things that Stefan had talked about so that if you want to check it out, you want to go uh, get some cool uh, sunglasses. Those sunglasses sound awesome. I think I might pick myself up a pair of those. <laughs> they sound really neat. Uh, but we'll have a link in our show notes to all that stuff. So if you guys are interested, uh, you can link to it that way or you can just pull it up on your own. So. Uh, Stefan, thank you so much for coming on the show. We just really appreciate it. Thanks, guys. All right, so this is the point in the show whenever we uh, play one of our questions from the audience, and this question comes from Nick Patel, and here's his question. Hi, Preston and Stig. My name is Nick, and I'm calling from Atlanta, Georgia. Let me start by saying that you guys are doing a, a fantastic service for the value investing community. Thank you so much for bringing in um, Guy Spear on the podcast. Um, so I had a question about um, putting all your eggs in one basket. I've heard that saying a lot, and I do understand the inherent risk um, that it, it, it poses. Um, but I do understand that when, um, you know, the stocks are at maybe an all time high or, you know, close about to their all time high. And if you put all your eggs in one basket and if you have a drop like uh, the recent drop in oil that we had, you're uh, likely going to incur a lot of losses. But what about when the stocks are beaten down 50, 60 percent? Like um, I'd like to talk about oil again, where you have really good companies that are that are just severely beaten down um, because of oil, but they're still fundamentally very strong and nothing has changed fundamentally uh, in terms of valuations for those companies and they look really cheap. So at that particular point, what do you think about putting, if not all, you know, majority of the eggs in one basket, maybe 50 or 60 percent of your portfolio in oil related stocks? I'd really appreciate your answer and insight um, to this question. Thank you so much. Okay, Nick, so fantastic question. Uh, Stig's going to go ahead and uh, answer your question for you. So, uh, Nick, like you, I'm a strong believer in a concentrated portfolio. And when I say concentrated, I would say for most investors, if you have something like 10 to 15 stocks uh, in, in different industries, I think, you know, as a rule of thumb, I think you should be, uh, you should be good to go. So you specifically asked about 50 to 60 percent in oil stocks and as you could probably hear from my more like generic uh, answer uh, when I say like 10 to 15 stocks uh, I would probably say that that 50 to 60 percent is is way too concentrated and I would say it's 
too concentrated for advanced investors and it's definitely too advanced for a beginning investor. So, um, so that was really to answer that question. But on the flip side, I personally think that you're, you're right about the oil industry. That is probably one of the few industries where you can still find great stocks at uh, decent prices. And note that I'm saying decent prices. I'm not saying that it's like once in a lifetime bargains. It's not like, even though that you hear in the news that, you know, all stocks has dropped this and that, I don't think that we are in 2009. It's not really that great of opportunities, but it's definitely um, great companies with, uh, with somewhat low prices that we're seeing at the moment. And uh, this really um, makes me think of security analysis by Benjamin Graham, because in this book, he talks about how low prices in itself can be a margin of safety. So this is not the same as saying as oil stocks cannot drop even more in price. Uh, of course they can, and especially they can't do that in the short run. But it means that even if you're slightly wrong in your perception of a great company, it's very unlikely that you will lose your principal. And that's an extremely important point when you talk about stock investing. Because what we see right now is high uncertainty in the oil industry, but I also think that we see low risk. So in this sense, low risk of losing the principal. So, Nick, uh, my thoughts, I'm, I'm in total agreement with Stig. The only caveat that I'm going to say as far as having the weighted uh, portfolio of 50 or 60 percent into one thing, I think if you're doing that potentially with an index, say you wanted to have 25 percent of your portfolio in an S&P 500 index and maybe the other 25 percent in a, an index that has money into the top 1,000 capitalized companies, I think that that's not a bad thing because you're spreading the money across just numerous companies. But whenever you're dealing with individual stock picks, I think going anything over maybe 20 to 25 percent is really starting to push it because you're not protecting your downside at that point. If something if you're not accounting for a variable that maybe you're missing, whenever you're dealing with individual stock picks, I'm always thinking to myself, what is it that I am missing? Uh, Because there's just so many variables out there that there's a good chance you might be missing something. So your other question is about the oil industry in general and saying that they're undervalued at this point. And that's something that I think that you've got to be very hesitant to quickly come to that conclusion of that the oil industry is undervalued. Whenever I see a large industry like that moving in a, in a certain direction uh, right, right now with it all moving down, I try to understand what are the critical variables that are causing that. And so I went through uh, Lean Six Sigma one time, and I had this instructor who was this uh, risk manager, uh, efficiency expert that worked for the Bank of America, and he was a master black belt in Lean Six Sigma. And he had this saying, and it was a really funny saying, and I'll never forget the saying. He said, take the Jerry Garcia method. And he said, get as high as you can and stay there for as long as you can. And I thought it was really funny because what he was saying is he wasn't implying that you should get high. What he was actually implying was that you need to look at things from the highest vantage point that you can. So when you're looking at the oil industry, the first thing you should ask yourself is, why is all these oil stocks going down? What is causing that? And so when you look at it from a very high vantage point, you realize that there's an enormous shift, an enormous change in the supply and demand of energy companies around the world. So then you have to ask yourself, well, what's causing that shift? Why is there a change in the supply and demand? What's going to be the long-term impact of the supply and demand? And you have to start with those really big questions first. And you've got to fully understand those big variables, those big chunks. And then once you feel like you really understand it, you can start digging down more into the weeds of the smaller, maybe indirect variables that are causing it. So I guess my point is this. Don't be really quick to just say the, the industry is undervalued. I would argue you have to fully understand the big variables and really try to, to pressure yourself to understand what those variables are before you act on any type of decision to buy an individual stock pick in that particular type of industry. Because it might persist for another year or another two years, and then you're starting to worry about opportunity costs and where you could maybe put your money that would have maybe served it better until you started to see that supply and demand maybe start to change and shift in the opposite direction. So really long answer. I apologize for that, but some different nuggets to maybe think about as you're assessing individual stock picks and how you're balancing your portfolio. Always protect your downside. That's a, protect your principal. Yeah. And, and this, this is just really, really a, a quick uh, comment here. Uh, I completely agree with what Preston is saying. 
Um, one thing that you should definitely pay attention to when you are analyzing something, for instance, like the oil sector, is that the data that you're having is looking back in time. And if you're looking back, uh, say the last few years, you're looking at oil price above a hundred dollars. So you cannot like uh, say that. Well, we're probably going to have the same earnings if the earnings are based on the oil oil price of fifty dollars. So just remember that when you are looking at the valuation today and you're using historical data. Exactly. That that is nail on the head, Stig. So it, when you're when you're looking at that, it's. Uh, the, the valuation, yeah, it's undervalued if you're still valuing oil at $100 a barrel or more, but maybe the outlook in the future, and that's the hard part, that's what you've got to do the research on. What is the value of a barrel of oil going to be as we look towards the next five or 10 years? And then you have to value the companies based on that. So we'll leave it at that. Uh, great, fantastic question because it really makes you think uh, when you're looking across individual stock picks. So we really appreciate that. We'll send a free signed copy of the Warren Buffett accounting book to you in the mail. And uh, that completes our show. So we'd like to thank Stefan for coming on the show. We really had a fun time talking with him. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you guys next week. Thanks for listening to The Investor's Podcast. To listen to more shows or access to the tools discussed on the show, be sure to visit www.theinvestorspodcast.com. Submit your questions or request a guest appearance to the Investors Podcast by going to www.asktheinvestors.com. If your question is answered during the show, you will receive a free autographed copy of the Warren Buffett Accounting Book. This podcast is for entertainment purposes only. This material is copyrighted by the TIP Network and must have written approval before commercial application. 